I've been doing trees here for close to 40 years now. Hard to believe. <laughs> um, but as she said, I've planted in my lifetime probably 30 to 40,000 trees. And what I find really cool about that is every time I plant a tree, I think, wow, you know, this could be here long after I'm gone. This is my legacy. And I tell my kids, you know, I'm not leaving you any money. Look around because there's plenty of trees out there. Um, <clears throat> there's a great quote by the British author George Orwell, and I'll kind of paraphrase it. It says, the planting of a tree, especially one of the long-living hardwood species, is a gift that you can make to posterity. And it, at almost no cost, and with almost no effort, and if it should take root, it'll far outlast any of the result of any of your actions, good or evil. So that's a nice thought. But unfortunately, far too often, people plant trees and they make critical mistakes along the way, and the trees never even come close to reaching maturity. And I've seen these mistakes over the years, and I'm going to try to go through and talk about <clears throat> you know, those problems and what we can do about them. Because this is a tree for posterity. This is not far from my property in Charlotte. This tree was probably a sapling when there were battles, gunship battles being fought in the Revolutionary War on Lake Champlain. But then in the worst cases, we do stuff like that. And that. And these these are not trees for posterity. <coughs> nice try. Oh, yeah. And then we love our trees so much that every year we pile mulch on them to the point where we're slowly killing them. So if we're going to think about how to, how to plant trees for posterity, what do trees need? What do they what do they have in their natural environment? So if you go out in the woods, what do you see? Typically, in, within a very small area, you can see a wide diversity of species dependent on the terrain. Or you might have a low-lying spot with poor drainage. You're going to find a different species than you're going to find on a high, rocky hillside. They each find their niche based on soil types, based on the microclimates. And you have this constant cycling of nutrients, leaves and debris falling down every year, rotting into the soil, a really rich, rich environment there, well aerated, holds a lot of moisture, awesome environment for microorganisms, beneficial mycorrhizal fungal relationships between the tree roots and the fungus that are beneficial to the trees. This is, this is what trees want, okay? And at the base of every tree, this is what you see. A very pronounced root flare. These are the buttress roots. And the roots, and it's not just one tree, it's every tree. And if you've ever seen a large tree uprooted, it, it can have some larger tap roots that go deep, but the vast majority of the tree roots that are feeding, that are uptaking water and nutrients, are in that top profile of soil. And the reason being is the aeration. Tree roots need oxygen. So it all starts with choosing the right tree for the right place. Somebody didn't look up here when they planted this tree. And this is really typical. So <clears throat> when we plant a tree, there's a lot of considerations uh, on your site. So if you're a homeowner you, and you do any amount of gardening, you probably have a sense of what your soils are like. And how do you tell how well drained your soils are? Are they sandy soils? Are they clay soils? A lot of that can be done simply by smell, believe it or not, and by feel. So a very sandy soil that's not rich in nutrients, it's going to be really well drained, not going to retain a lot of water, going to tend to dry out, it's going to feel gritty, like sand on a beach. A, a really heavy clay soil, if you're, <coughs> excuse me, if you're to dig a hole, you're probably, especially in the spring, going to smell almost a septic-y kind of rotting smell. That's from uh, anaerobic conditions. 
saturation of the soil. You might see some modeling in the soil, like some gray modeling. And if you take that soil and you wet it a little bit, you can press it between your finger and your thumb and make sort of a ribbon with it. Clay soils can be really good for some trees, but they, they hold a lot more water, but you know, in heavy rain years, they can be slow to drain. They hold a lot of nutrients. So you have to evaluate your soils. And then you got to think about, and, and this is a common mistake that I see all the time, is people don't think about how big the trees are ultimately going to get. And I see this a lot, especially with people wanting to plant a little home orchard. So they'll go out and buy a half a dozen fruit trees, and they're tiny little things with a little bit of branching, and they'll plant them six feet apart. Well, what happens 10 years down the road? They're all growing into each other. There's no air circulation. There's not good light penetration and it's a lost cause. But, you know, I took a picture of this landscape. This is in Shelburne at a, at a retirement community. But maybe, maybe the objective here was to create a forest. I don't know. But in the foreground here, or right here, is an oak tree like the one you saw in the first photograph. And right next to it is a pine, and right behind it is a spruce here and a maple. And what do you think that's gonna look like in 20 years? These trees are going to start to shade each other out. In people's home landscapes, <clears throat> you really got to think about, you know, if you're planting a flowering tree, a flowering tree wants full sunlight, eight hours a day. Well, how about all the trees surrounding your property or other trees on your property? How are they going to interact with that tree 5, 10, 15, and 20 years down the road? So that's really something to think about. Um, you have to think about, <clears throat> of course, hardiness zones. We're here in the Champlain Valley, much warmer than different parts of the state. And as the climate is changing, we're finding that we're starting to plant some species that maybe we wouldn't have planted 20 years ago. But you have to think about low uh, soil temperatures. Overall space and soil volume is a big one. This is a challenge as a city arborist in Burlington that we come up against all the time. We're planting trees that will ultimately get quite large in a very narrow strip between the sidewalk and the road. And so the, the tree is limited by the amount of soil volume that it has for its roots to continue to grow out and expand in, in the surrounding soil. Um, so sometimes it may be wise, if you're on a new property, to take a soil test. Soil tests can tell you a lot. They'll, a lot of soil tests will give you <coughs> sort of a breakdown of your soil type, sandy loam, clay loam, but more importantly, <coughs> they'll talk about, um, and I won't go into detail on the science here, but they'll talk about organic matter, um, overall fertility, and your, and your major micro and or, uh, macro and micronutrients. Nitrogen, phosphorus, available phosphorus, potassium, important nutrients. Most soils, <laughs> un, native soils undisturbed on sites around the state have everything a tree needs. I've done a lot of soil tests over the years in my previous job, and it was rare to find things that were really, really deficient. But if you're on a new site, a new home site, where they came in, you see some of these new developments, what's the first thing they do? Break them down. They bulldoze <laughs> off all the topsoil, right? Then they dig these foundations and they go down six and eight feet and they take all that fill and they spread it over the area and they drive over it for months and months with heavy equipment. And then when the houses are built, they come in and put three inches of topsoil over top of that. So what you have there is very different. And it, and it may take some amending. Um, a lot of different, <coughs> several different ways that you can typically purchase trees at your local garden center. Bald and burlap trees. Bald and burlap trees are grown in a nursery for several years from a small sapling or whip, grown on for several years and then typically dug with a hydraulic tree spade. A hydraulic machine that has three blades, goes down, cuts the roots, lifts it up, and the tree is placed in these wire baskets and then shipped to the garden centers. 
Um, the nice thing about this is you've got a tree coming with soil on the roots, so it doesn't dry out as quickly. But even a tree of this size that maybe was only in a nursery for three or four years growing in a nursery, when this digging process takes place, as much as 75 to 85 percent of the existing root system is left in the field, is severed from the tree. So you're losing a lot of root system. These can be very successful despite that because trees are resilient and they will recover over time uh, and recover that root to shoot ratio. So what happens is <clears throat> when you remove that, that much of the root system in a given year, for the next couple years, it, there's, there's sort of a, a saying in the business that for every inch of caliper, inch of diameter of the trunk, it's going to take one year to recover before you're going to start seeing significant growth. Because trees grow, <clears throat> the top of the tree grows in direct proportion to the root system it has to support it. Trees don't put out more shoots, more new leaves than they have roots to support. So when you cut up, cut those off, the tree will adjust over time. Um, disadvantage <coughs> of this tree for the average homeowner is that this root ball here, which is about 28 inches in diameter, could probably weigh upwards of 250 to 300 pounds. So might require specialized equipment or you have to hire somebody to plant it, but you can ultimately get a bigger tree to start with. Um, general rule of thumb, if you're gonna buy a bald and burlap tree, one inch, a minimum of one inch of root ball diameter per inch of caliper. So if this was a, tw a two and a half inch tree, no less than 24 inches of root ball diameter. And I say this because I've seen trees in garden centers with root balls that were way too small. Remember back, we're, we're removing 75 to 80 percent of the root system. <clears throat> so you want to make sure you're, you're getting a bigger root ball as you should be. That root ball, that trunk of the tree should be centered in the root ball. And when you move the trunk a little bit, it shouldn't be wobbling in there. The burlap shouldn't be torn up. Um, you know. What's, what, the, what, what the top of the tree looks like is important, but what's below ground is, is equally important. So again, this is showing uh, you know, just the relative diameter of the root ball to the size of the tree here. The other way, typically a lot of homeowners buy <coughs> small trees is in containers in a garden center. This has a big advantage in that when you transplant that tree, you are taking the entire root system with it. You're not losing any, it's all contained in there. Um, typical homeowner can handle something like this. You know, they do sell trees in big, big containers, but you can get a decent sized tree in a 15 or 20 gallon pot and it can do quite well. Again, you're looking for, you know, the tree to be centered in there. Um, and if you were to pull the tree out of the pot at the garden center, this is what you should see. You might see some small fibrous roots around the edge of the pot, but you do not want to see large woody roots circling in there. This was at a garden center years ago, a Vermont garden center, where I just walked in and walked randomly up to some of their container grown trees. And this is what I found. Can you see that? This is not a tree for posterity. This is a tree that's going to go on your brush pile in about two years. This, this has a girdling, what we call a girdling root, already encircling the tree and embedded in the base of it. And over time, what happens with that is as that tree, as that root grows in diameter and the stem of that tree grows in diameter, it starts to compress the vascular tissue of the tree, essentially strangling it. And it is a chronic problem. This is what a tree like that would look like if you took it out of the container. And I tell people, if you're going to buy a tree in a container and you go to your local garden center, ask them to slide the tree out of the pot so you can look at the root system. And this has yet to come back and haunt me, but I know it's going to someday. Somebody, some garden center owner is going to say, hey, what are you telling people to have us slide the trees out? 
But what happens is these trees <coughs> start in a smaller pot, get potted up, get root bound. They take them, they bump them up to a bigger container. So now you've got a, a spiraling root system within. They leave it in that container too long. A few roots grow out, do the same thing, and you've got concentric layers of these girdling roots. <clears throat> and these are hard, woody roots, like, you know, this diameter of my finger. And I have seen cases in my previous job where I went on clients' properties and they had small trees that they had bought in containers several years prior. And they said to, uh, said to me, <clears throat> we planted these trees, you know, that we got at our local garden center and they really haven't done anything. And I'll walk up to them and I'll go like this with a stem and I can see a cracking in the mulch perfect circle and in one case I actually said to the lady do you trust me do you mind and I pulled the tree right out of the ground we've been there several years and had never rooted out into the surrounding soil it was just trying to exist off that wound up root system there but <clears throat> my previous employer was Bartlett tree experts and they had a research lab in North Carolina that I went to visit several times this was their solution to those root-bound, container-grown trees. And it's really the only thing you can do is to go in there with an ax and cut those roots and free them up so that new roots, uh, fibrous roots, will form off the end of those cuts and expand out into the soil. But in my opinion, you shouldn't go out and pay $150 for a tree and have to come home and take an ax to it. So, something to avoid. And this is after he had done that and essentially bare rooted the tree, teased all those roots out, and then planted it. This was a tree on their property where they had just taken that same type of container grown tree and stuck it in the ground. And this was several years later, and you can see what's happening here. So within a couple of years, these roots are going to be up against the trunk of that tree as it continues to expand the phloem, which is... If you remember your science class, the xylem and the phloem, the phloem is the vascular tissue just inside that inner bark layer, thin layer of cells that translocates the photosynthates, the products of photosynthesis, back to feed the root system of the tree. So over time, that gets compressed, so you're essentially cutting off the root system of the tree. And I have literally thousands and thousands of photographs over the years of this condition on trees, on private properties, commercial properties, municipal properties. We see this problem in Burlington on trees that were planted on the streets 30 years ago when they did, we didn't know at the time what we know now about planting. Another problem <coughs> that I see very often trees coming from nurseries that are planted too deep in the root ball, okay? So this was a tree, I, I did some consulting work for the state of Vermont. If you are familiar with Morrisville, a number of years ago, a bypass road was built around Morrisville, and over 700 trees were planted along that road, and I oversaw the, the tree planting on that project. And this is a tree that came from a nursery, and you can clearly see the soil line here. This is when, when we opened the root ball, we started digging down and looking for that natural root flare that we saw in those first pictures. And, and we, we weren't even quite there yet. And you can see that distance. And we'll talk about why that's an issue. And this is another tree from that same job. Felco pruners are eight and a quarter inches long if you were to measure them. You see the soil line up here, and this sort of swelling here is where the tree was grafted. That's the graft union, and down here we're just starting to see the natural flare of the root system that it was grafted onto. Planting trees too deep will kill trees. Sometimes it happens really quickly, sometimes it can take 10 or 15 years. This tree right here was one that I sold from a nursery that I operated for 22 years in Charlotte, and I sold it to a landscaper who took it, along with about a dozen others, <coughs> to line a driveway in Charlotte, a private residence. Very heavy clay soil here. 
It was a June. It was June of 2013, I guess, because the date's on the photo. Um, he, he came and got him in late April. The trees were just starting to bud out. They were all healthy. And a few weeks later, he called me and he said, one of these trees is just petering out. I said, I'm happy to come take a look at it. And when I got there, this is what I found. You see how the, <coughs> what the base of this tree looks like? Looks like a pole going in the ground. Well, it turns out we had had a really wet June or May that year heavy clay soil. He went in there with an excavator and dug holes, just plopped these trees in, and this tree was planted way too deep. And what happened was the soil was so saturated <coughs> that the water, the groundwater was almost up to the surface and this tree suffocated. Because when the soil becomes totally saturated and, the, and it's a species that isn't acclimated to that type of soil, the root function will cease to exist because the oxygen level in the soil is below a threshold where root systems can continue to function. And as I said, sometimes this planting too deep of trees takes years before you see the problems. This was a guy I knew in Charlotte who called me on the 4th of July one year. This was a number of years ago and said, I have this beautiful sugar maple that I planted 11 years ago on my front lawn, and it's not looking good, and I'm worried about it. Can you come and take a look? And so I said, sure. So I went down the road, and I got there, and you'll notice this tree. It's not a great photograph, but pulling in the driveway, the two things I notice about this tree, discoloration in the top of the crown and look kind of thin, and the base of the tree to me looked like a telephone pole going in the ground. I started to excavate around it with a little claw tool. And this is what I found. These are girdling roots here, here, and here embedded in the base of this tree. And you can actually see a little swelling here. You see that on the sides? And that's because as that vascular tissue got compressed, there was a backup, <laughs> essentially, of the photosynthates and the starches being stored there that caused that swelling. I called this guy up. He had gone to put his boat in the water, and I said, your tree's a goner. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, it has these girdling roots. You know, it's too late. I'm starting to see decline in the crown. He wouldn't believe it. He went back. I said, all you can try to do is cut those roots to free them and see if the tree will recover. But in my experience, this tree is going to make it. And he called me the following year and said, you were right, the tree didn't make it. But the interesting thing here was <clears throat> I explained to him that this tree got planted too deep. That natural root flare got buried. And over time, tree roots grew upward and started encircling the tree. And I see this all the time. And he said to me, he said, my son and I planted these trees. There was another one on the other side of the driveway. He said it took us the whole weekend. We got them from the local garden center. We dug holes. We, you know, we did everything right. And we planted the top of that root ball even with the existing grid of the surrounding soil. What do you think the problem was? It came from the nursery already too deep in the root ball. So if you're not aware of that problem and you're planting a, a bald and burlap tree or even a container tree, they do the same thing. This is what happens, and, and I see this all the time. We're seeing it in Burlington now on trees that have been in the ground 25 years. And now they're dying because they were planted too deep and it took that long for these girdling roots to develop. And by the time you start to see the decline in the crown of the tree, game over. So. If you're interested in planting trees, the thing I tell you first is go look at the trees you have first. And if you walk up to your trees and they look like a telephone pole and you're not yet seeing the decline in the crown of the tree, check this out. And there's, there's ways to excavate and check this out. Another shot of the same tree, you can clearly see those, those roots embedded here. I would say Conservatively, and when I'm out in the field and I'm looking at big commercial jobs, new buildings where they go in and landscape, 
even on private properties, in recent years, 70% of the trees I see are planted too deep with this root flare buried. So I've been giving this talk for a lot of years and I haven't changed it much because I keep seeing the same problems. So I'm gonna keep talking about it just like your parents would hound you about the same things and tell you. Why is that right? happening? Because people are educated about it. And a lot of landscapers out there that I've known for many years know of this problem and they're aware of it. And if they're out there doing the work themselves, they will mitigate these problems. But they, uh, there's a lack of training. And in a seasonal business where you hire people in the spring and, you know, and, and a lot of landscapers will say, oh, I hired this great guy. He's been working for so-and-so for this many years. He has all the experience. Well, he may not have been doing it right all those years. So I'm really going to drive this point home. <clears throat> this is a property on the north end of Burlington. It's a condo association way out off of North Ave. And in my previous job, I was called here. These are Princeton elms, a selection of American elm lining the driveway. And they were worried about the health of a number of these trees. So I pulled in here, and I don't know how well you can see this from the back of the room, but the tree in the foreground, nice full crown, great color, looking robust. And if you look at the base of it right here, you can see that root flare. You can see those surface roots going out from the base there. And that's what the rest of them look like. They were planted at the same size on the same day in the same soil conditions, received the same care, and the only difference was some were planted too deep and that one was planted at the proper depth. So, <clears throat> a number of tree care companies around the area employ this technique. This was partly tree experts who I worked for, and this is an air spade. So this is a specialized nozzle it was actually developed, my understanding is, for military use to expose landmines. Where they take a compressor and they put high pressure air through it with a specialized nozzle and you can blow the soil away without injuring roots. So when we would go onto properties where there were these medium aged trees like this, and if we suspected this, this girdling root problem was developing, within a few minutes we could take this tool and blow the soil away without going in there and digging physically with tools and injuring that root system and we could expose that root system and see what was going on and it was crazy the stuff we found it but it was fun also because I would tell the homeowner here's what's going on below the soil and I would explain this to him and then we come in and and it, I was a hero because I showed him but I was also called Dr. Death on one occasion because this, these people's tree was completely shot. This is one tree that we exposed here, and you can clearly see this root, but we were able to cut that root off because it was not yet embedded in that tree, and we were able to save this tree. And what will happen is, you see right here, this is the graft union of the tree, this swelling. That's not the actual root flare. On grafted trees, the root flare is typically two to three inches below that graft union is where you're going to find that flare. So obviously you can't excavate a ton of soil away from the tree, but <clears throat> when trees are planted too deep, they will develop roots above that natural root flare. We call them adventitious roots, and those can be problematic. And if you catch a tree at this age, you can remove them without doing a harm to the tree and you can save it for the long term. So birch, similar situation, you can see these roots going in every direction here. No future for this tree if you don't get in there and mitigate this problem. And here's another problem we see all the time. Is people not removing these wire baskets. So when you plant a bald and burlap tree, they typically come in a preformed wire basket. It's a pretty heavy gauge, galvanized steel. I've excavated trees that were planted 25 and 30 years ago, and this basket might be a little rusted, but it does not break down. 
that wire is still like the day you put it in. So what happens over time is that these roots grow through these openings, and <coughs> you can see here, and imagine that root, the root, well, the root grows much like the trunk of the tree, expands outward like this. So over time that wire is going to start to girdle portions of that root system. Now, I, don't, I can't say for certain that it's going to kill the tree over time, but remember back to when I told you that trees grow in proportion to the root system, they have, you know, they don't put out any more shoots or, or branches than the root system they have to support it. So what do you suppose happens when a significant portion of the root system gets girdled and those roots beyond that girdling are no longer functioning? You'll start to see some decline in the crown of the tree. It's a simple process to remove that basket. Now, now I'm going to go through a simple process of planting a tree, and I've done a lot of them this way, and it's quite successful. So this is a tree that came from my nursery years ago. I planted it for a neighbor down the road from my house. I thought she might be here today. I'm glad she's not. <laughs> she, anyway, she likes to talk a lot. And so when she came out and watched me plant this tree, babe, 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 I gave her a camera. At the time, nobody was taking pictures on phones. I gave her a camera. I said, Laura, every time I tell you, I want you to snap a picture. So I got a great sequence of pictures of how to properly plant a tree. So if you're planting a tree, <clears throat> whether it's on your own property or somebody else's property, or you're working with a community group and you're going to plant on public property, first thing you want to do is called dig safe toll free free service they notify all the utilities in the area within 48 hours they'll come out if you have the site mark they'll mark gas lines underground lines so you don't run into any problems because when we plant trees in burlington there's stuff underground everywhere so <clears throat> typical recommendation is to dig a hole it is two times or three times the diameter of the root ball. Now that's a good general rule, but if you're planting in an area like this, this was an open pasture area out in front of their house that had been undisturbed for many, many years. So this was good native soil. I could take a shovel and just right into the ground. Much different if you're on a you know, new site with compacted soil, you want that bigger hole. This, this hole wasn't as large as I would normally dig. But first thing I do is remove the sod. So I cut the sod, cut it into sections, skim it off just below that root system. <clears throat> I typically do not put the sod back in the planting hole with the tree. And I find it's hard to chop it up and fill in those air pockets. You know, it kind of goes in in clumps. So I take that, set it aside. You can compost it. You can patch your lawn with it if you got some divots in your lawn. And then the next thing is to determine the depth of the hole that you want to dig. So here's a standard root system. And you remember what I said is sometimes these trees can plant it too deep from the nursery. So how deep am I going to dig the hole? You got to take a look inside the top of that root ball and determine where that root flare is. Well, this tree is one that I grew myself in the nursery I was running at the time, so I knew that root flare was right at the surface of the soil there. So I just took a stake and I marked it, so that was going to be my depth. But if you were to plant a bald and burlap tree or a container grown tree, you get it next to the hole. You remove soil from the top of that root ball, like with a bald and burlap tree, you can just take a utility knife, cut that burlap away, start excavating with a little tool, find that root flare. Sometimes you might be removing three, four, and five, and six inches of soil before you find it. Now, your depth of your hole is going to be from the bottom of the root ball to wherever you determined that root flare to be. No reason to dig a hole any deeper. If you dig a real deep hole and then you put soil back in, over time it's going to settle and the tree can either list to one side or the other or end up too deep. 
So then I dug my hole and I put a flat rake. You can use the stake across. Where did it fall in relation to my marker? I needed to plant a little deeper here or dig a little deeper. So then when I got that done, I, got the, I get the root ball next to the hole, take a $12 pair of bolt cutters that I got at the local hardware store, and I cut this <coughs> vertical wire right below the bottom horizontal wire on the root ball all the way around. So you cut, 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 tip the root ball over, do the other side, pull the bottom of the basket right off. Still holding together because I got that wire all around the sides. So there's the bottom off. Then <coughs> I typically cut the top and the bottom horizontal on one side of the tree, leave the middle one, tip the tree over, do the same thing on the other side. That tree is not coming apart. That root ball is not coming apart. <coughs> Get the tree in the hole probably require equipment or somebody younger than me than I am now but um, get it positioned in the hole in the center of the hole make sure you're straight from side to side then I go back and I cut that single wire on either side of the tree and that whole basket comes off in two pieces gone remove the burlap Burlap on trees that you find in the garden center will rot away over time, but it is treated with a chemical that will keep it there for a while. So any barrier between that root ball and the existing soil that, that's going to inhibit quick new root growth out into the surrounding soil, get rid of it. Very simple. I take, I typically used to take our kitchen scissors, and my wife will tell you they disappear, and I cut this off. And then I start to backfill. I like when I plant a tree to put a tarp off to the side, plant, put all my soil on a tarp, put my sod on the tarp, no mess, shovel it back in. So I'm going all around the tree and I fill in about a third of the way up. And then I take my shovel and I'm removing those air pockets, making sure it's settled. Might do a little light tamping with my feet, taking out any major rocks or debris <coughs> that I find. Again, some light tamping, you're not stomping it, and then mulch. Now mulch is a good thing for trees. If you think back to what I said at the beginning, trees in their natural environment, there's a, a natural mulch every year. And silly us, every year when the leaves come down, what do we do? We rake them all up and we put them in bags or we cart them away. When we, what we really ought to be doing is mulching them and putting them back around the trees because that's what they want. Um, mulch retains moisture, reduces weed competition, keeps soil temperatures cooler, better environment for new rooting, um, but it can be too much of a, mul of a good thing. I recommend two to three inches of mulch around the surface and never up against the trunk of the tree if you look close here, you can still see the root flare here. So we keep it away from the base of the trunk of the tree, and we only put two to three inches. And that's not two to three inches every year after year after year and let it build up. There's no reason to continue to put mulch on trees. Maybe every couple of years you put a thin layer. Then you want to water. Best way to water trees is put your hose in a five gallon pail, turn it on on a trickle, and see how long it takes to fill up. So you have an idea of how many minutes it takes to put X number of gallons of water on the tree. Put your hose at the base of the tree, that's not what I did here, but turn it on a trickle and let it go slowly. So it's a slow seeping into the soil. The other great mechanism are these watering bags that zip up around the tree. They typically hold 20 gallons of water. They have little pinholes in the bottom. You fill them once a week, you're putting 20 gallons of water on the tree, and it's going right where you want it. People go out with a hose and they're just like, shh, and they think they're putting a ton of water on their tree, and most of it's running off and outside of the root zone of that tree, and it's not doing any good. <clears throat> and, you know, you can overwater too. Keep in mind what kind of soils you have. On a sandier soil, 
It's going to drain more quickly, dry out more quickly, you're going to be watering more frequently. So there's a little common sense in there. Clay soils are going to retain the moisture a lot longer. Staking trees. Should we stake trees? I rarely stake bald and burlap trees that I plant so long as the root, the tree is solid in that root ball. A lot of studies have shown that the movement of a tree after you plant it from the wind, just that movement, is actually stimulating new root growth and, and stimulating cell growth so the trunk of the tree grows in diameter. <clears throat> if you go down to the lake or out to an exposed site and you look at big, larger trees, on the prevailing wind side of the trees, like along the lake, on the lake side, side of the trees, you'll see a much more pronounced root flare on that side of the tree. Because from that constant wind blowing, the root system on that side of the tree builds up to anchor the tree. If you are going to <clears throat> stake your trees, and the young trees that we plant in Burlington, we do stake them. We use two hardwood stakes about 18 to 24 inches out from the sides of the tree on either side, pound them in 8-10 inches, and then we use a 12 gauge or 17 gauge wire that you can get at your local hardware store, and we run these nylon straps around the trunk of the tree, just around one side, not wrapping it completely around. And they have grommets, you run the wire through the grommets back to the post, and you tighten it up. You don't have to get it tight tight because again you want some movement there. But what if, if you don't have those straps you can use a piece of hose. But if you're going to do that, make sure that the hose is actually protecting the trunk of the tree. And typically after one growing season that tree, if it was well cared for, should have rooted in really well. And you can remove the wires. People leave them on and this is what happens. And not good. Mulch. <laughs> you know, this is what we don't want to do with our trees. A month from now, <clears throat> take my word for it, you're going to see this. <clears throat> All over Chittenden County, there's companies that make their living off of slowly killing trees. They go in every year with truckloads of mulch, and this is what they do. They pile it on. This is right on Route 7 in Shelburne. Years ago, I was so disturbed by what I was seeing here that I went out and I made my little mulch meter. I took a yardstick and I made this sliding thing on it. And it's hard to tell there, but that is 13 inches right there. So about 14 inches of mulch above the surface. This is no different than planting the tree too deep. Tissue, trunk tissue is much different than the bark on the trunk of the tree is much different than the surface of what's covering your roots. And so over time, this is going to start rotting the bark, uh, rotting the uh, bark of the tree, get fungus problems in there. A lot of fibrous roots will, whoops, a lot of fibrous roots will grow up into this mulch and actually make it more prone to drought over time. So um, the one other thing I'll say is, uh, Success comes in planting a tree from the time you pick it up at the garden center to you actually get it in the ground. And I see people all the time in the spring, they get all excited about their plants, they go to the garden center on a Saturday, and you're shaking your head, you've done this. I did that with my quince. <laughs> <laughs> you buy a plant, you buy a tree, you come home, it's late in the day, uh, I, got, I gotta be at dinner at my neighbor's house, and you leave it off to the side. The next day something comes up, Right, you're laughing back there, you've done that as well, <laughs> right? And it sits on the side of your driveway and the pavement's there and the temperature gets up to 110 on the pavement, the tree's drying out and it's dying. So you gotta take care of that tree from the time you leave the garden center until you get it in the ground. So, you know, if we pick the right tree for the right place, we follow these general guidelines of proper planting Proper planting depth is key. You don't over mulch, you don't do this. And you gotta water that tree religiously throughout its establishment period. So for larger trees like the two inch bald and burlap tree, that could be two or three growing seasons. If it looks good at the end of the first season in the following year you have a severe drought, all those new roots that grew out into the soil can be really prone to die. 
So long-term care, and if we do all that, hopefully, 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 <laughs> we're planting trees for posterity. They're gonna be there long after we're gone. So a couple of years ago, I did a video on Arbor Day at the University of Vermont where we planted a bare root tree. And the guy sat there and videotaped me so if you want a little tutorial on planting bare root trees where I talk about a lot of these same issues, but you can really see the root system of the tree, it's a great little entertaining video. And that was my son who's now 22. <laughs> so I took this photo a long time ago. This was in my backyard. So if you have any questions, that's a, that's a crash course in tree planting. <laughs> All good? I have a question. Um, what kind of mulch do you use? What kind of mulch? There's been, there was actually a woman out in uh, Washington State who did an extensive study on different types of mulch. Hemlock mulch versus pine, ground pine bark versus leaves, you know, composted leaves and wood, just wood chips straight out of the wood chipper. And she found that the wood chips straight out of the wood chipper are just as good as anything else. At my own house, in the last several years, what I've been doing is, in the fall, when I rake up my leaves, I kind of get them in sort of a pile. I set my lawnmower up really high, and I go over them two, three times, kind of chop them up. And then I rake them in to the rings around my tree. Isn't that what they want? Yeah. Maple trees out on the side of the mountain are not growing with hemlock, ground hemlock bark around the base of them, right? They're growing with decaying sugar maple leaves. So there's something to be said about that. So I went to a conference a number of years ago and this guy did a whole talk about leave the leaves. That's why they call them leaves. <laughs> leave them there, right? And it's crazy. In Burlington, they, the city picks up people's bagged leaves. And, and, you know, it's, it's just nuts. In a perfect world, I would recommend a, a mulched area of natural decaying stuff out to the drip line of the tree. Of course, you wouldn't have any lawn, but it would be less mowing. But that's what the tree really wants, right? So over time, my trees on my own property, I, I expand that a little every year. They're not out to the drip lines, but that's... You know, look to nature. Nature's got it right. We mess things up. So, anybody else? If you are putting wood chips, or if I were to put wood chips around the base of a tree, would there be a problem growing mushrooms in there, like wine caps, gangster barrier? No. What you want? You want to grow them in there? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Go for They're it. Very tasty mushrooms. They're easy to grow. Yep. But they grow on wood chips. Cool. You can, the only thing I would say is you can run into problems with, <clears throat> supposedly, um, and it wouldn't be very common, but there are certain tree species that the, the chemicals in the, in the wood of the tree can have what's called an allelopathic effect. So over time as they break down, they actually have a growth regulating like black uh, walnuts. Like black walnuts would be a good example. Willows, some certain willows can have that effect. But I mean, it'd be, you know, it'd be odd for you to get a load of wood chips that was all black walnut. Well, I, I have wooded property, so I mean, there are th places that I'm trying to take away some of the things that the previous owner had grown, mm -hmm. so make the wood chips out of that. I don't think we have any black walnuts. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? You probably did really well on time. Yes, sir. So in one of the other lectures today, um, the speaker um, was recommending against mowing the leaves because he or she, I don't remember which speaker it was, uh, felt that that was destroying um, the habitats that for the insects. <coughs> Insect larvae and stuff. Yeah. Like, so, so which is, which is, which is well, what we do. <laughs> so I think that's a good point. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think it depends. If you did it as soon as the leaves come down, you're probably okay. 
later in the season, things are starting to pupate or, or go into that decomposing material. Um, you know, I typically do it right off when the leaves come down. I go out there and just mow a little bit. It just helps them break down faster. Thank you. We good? How are we on time? Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. That Thank works. you. Yeah.